Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, the uh, title being, uh, now that they've won, what will they do? Uh, policy and politics in the new administration. Uh, today we have the uh, pleasure, the distinct pleasure, of listening to four Cornell experts, uh, experts of uh, American policy and American politics, uh, and they'll be giving their views on the consequences of yesterday's historic election. Uh, my name is Robert Hutchins. Uh, I'm the director of Cornell and Washington. Uh, this is the kind of event that Cornell and Washington is just delighted to be involved with. Uh, as you probably know, uh, about uh, 50 or so undergraduates will go down to Washington every semester. Uh, they'll come from all of Cornell, Cornell's colleges and programs. Uh, they work as interns in government offices uh, or in nonprofit organizations or in private firms. Uh, they take classes and they live uh, at our building on uh, or close to DuPont Circle. Students uh, who participate in the Cornell at Washington program uh, will be working on some of the issues that we'll be talking about today. Um, and uh, just for the undergraduates who are here, uh, you know, you could do that. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite easy to apply to the program. Uh, you can uh, develop an internship that uh, is tailored to your own interests, to your career interests, uh, perhaps. Uh, and uh, you can live in one of the world's most fascinating cities. If you're interested in speaking about that, I'd be just delighted to chat with you about the, the possibilities of Cornell and Washington. So the idea for this event came from a conversation with Ted Lowy back in 2008. Uh, he said, well, why not have a discussion of the policy and political consequences of the election, uh, something of interest to our students? Uh, and of course, that's a, a, a great idea in terms of the mission of Cornell and Washington. Um, so uh, since it was a good idea then, we introduced, we had a program like that uh, in 2000, or uh, had this form of program in 2008. And uh, it continues to be a good idea, so we thus have uh, this program today. Uh, so here's how we'll proceed. Uh, each speaker will have eight or so minutes to talk about their views on what uh, the new Obama administration will be doing. Uh, they'll be looking at uh, perhaps the politics, uh, the policy, the problems with a, a, an eye to the future. Um, then the panel members will have an opportunity to discuss between themselves things that they might, might feel it uh, needs to be filled in or areas of uh, agreement or disagreement. Um, and that should then leave us with uh, roughly 20 minutes or so at the end uh, for questions and comments from the floor. Uh, and we'll end at, uh, at 6 o'clock. Um, so the order of the speakers is going to be, we'll start with Professor Booth and Professor Sanders, Professor Logoball, and Professor Altschuler. Let me make some introductions uh, before we begin. Um, I'll uh, begin with uh, Glenn Altschuler. Glenn Altschuler is the uh, Thomas and Dorothy Litvin Professor of American Studies. He's also the Dean of the School of Continuing Education and Summer Sessions, as well as the Vice President of uh, University, for, uh, Vice President for University Relations. Uh, he's written nine books and several hundred essays and reviews, uh, many of which deal with uh, American politics and American policy. Um, he's received several teaching awards, including the Weiss Presidential Fellowship for the Teaching of Undergraduates. Uh, uh, professor Logoval is uh, the, Fred, is the uh, John S. Knight Professor of uh, International Studies. He's a historian and has published uh, numerous books and articles on U.S. foreign policy. Um, and he is currently the director of the Mario, Mario Anadi uh, Center for International Studies. Uh, professor Sanders is a professor of government. Uh, she's a scholar of, the, of American political institutions and has written extensively on the rise and fall of U.S. regulatory institutions. Um, she is currently working on a book entitled President's War and Reform which analyzes the contributions of presidents to both reform legislation and uh, foreign policy choices. And Professor Booth is a, a professor of city and regional planning. He's a lawyer by training who has written extensively on environmental issues. He's currently writing a book about America's failure to respond to the growing global environment threats. Um, he's held several public positions. Uh, he is currently a member of the New York State Adirondack Park Agency uh, and a past uh, alderperson uh, for the, on the Ithaca uh, Common Council 
please join me in welcoming the panel. To this panel. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Professor Book. Thank you. I was here four years ago on that panel. They invited me back. It's probably because I was so wrong that they wanted to give me a second chance to say what's likely to happen. Uh, first, it's important to be appreciative for all the problems we have of, of two things that were very evident yesterday and are still evident. Uh, they're very positive about American politics. People vote freely. They, they're not coerced. And secondly, the results flow from what the people say in the voting booths. And there's never any question that that's the outcome. And those are two important and enduring qualities of American politics. It's also important we have a clear winner. Uh, it is dangerous, in my opinion, for the United States to pick a president through the courts. That's happened once uh, in our lifetime, and it, it ought not happen uh, again. But uh, uh, luckily, we have a clear uh, winner. Last night, I, I, I meant to go to bed early. I told myself what I, what I was going to, but I'm a political junkie, and I couldn't turn the television off. And so I finally went to bed at 2.30. And around 12 midnight or so, when they called the election for President Obama, I said, well, it's deja vu. Uh, President Obama has won again. It's a fairly close election. The public is deeply divided about the role of government, uh, the size of government, the intrusiveness of government. And then on reflecting further, when, you know, by the time it gets to 2.30 in the morning, you had a lot more time to think and wonder. I realized, it, well, it's not really deja vu all over again. Uh, the president's electoral uh, margin is much narrower than it was. He was elected by a much narrower electoral mar uh, vote margin. Uh, uh, many fewer Americans voted than voted uh, four years ago. Uh, the annual federal deficits are now much larger than they were. The, federal, the accumulated federal debt is far, far larger uh, than it was. The president is starting a second term. The history of presidents in second terms has not been a hopeful one uh, for many presidents. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, R Ronald Reagan, President Clinton, George Bush, the second uh, all had uh, substantial problems in their second terms. Uh, it's not an easy road because everybody in Washington knows a second term president is leaving at some point and uh, that, that creates its own dynamics. Um, in addition, the president does not have behind him the enthusiasm he had four years ago. He's won a major political victory, but it's not the way it was four years ago. Uh, he is facing a deeply divided Congress, whereas when he took office, he, uh, his party controlled both houses of Congress. Uh, the uh, country is now a number of years into uh, steep unemployment, and, and, and that's a, a significant problem for millions of Americans. And civility, which was not high four years ago, has declined further in American politics, and both parties are substantial contributors to the decline in civility in American public life. In the near term, I suspect that with a lot of showboating and political brinksmanship, uh, the, the Congress that's now sitting, not the new Congress, uh, the, new, the Congress that's sitting is going to have to make some decisions or not make some decisions by, I think, January 1st. Otherwise, a variety of automatic tax increases kick into place and a number of major spending limitations kick into place. Most members of Congress don't want either of those things to happen, but there's vast disagreement as to what to do about that. My guess is there will be a deal. Uh, the president will get some kind of tax on those who are very wealthy, uh, but by and large it will be driven by significant uh, expenditure cuts, uh, and that will, that will be uh, the deal. Uh, going out a little further, I'm not sure about the date, but the, the country faces another budget ceiling debate. Congress has to vote to raise the amount of money that can be part of the, the accumulated federal debt. Uh, this brought the country almost a fiscal, uh, uh, to, the, to almost a fiscal shutdown uh, two years ago or so. And, and again, I think there will be a lot of brinksmanship. Uh, that was decided literally in the last 12 hours, as I recall. I think that will probably get decided again, and there'll be some kind of a deal that will have something on, on both sides uh, for, the, for the Democrats and for, uh, and for the Republicans. Longer term, uh, issues like unemployment, job creation, the scale of the annual deficits, uh, what to do, or what to begin doing, I should say, about the scale of the national debt, trade balance with China and with other 
countries, um, some realistic progress regarding global warming and energy policy, and the fact that America's schools are falling, uh, apparently falling farther and farther behind in terms of competitiveness, uh, particularly in terms of uh, science and, and math education. Uh, the country, I think, will, will take, will, will try to grapple with those issues, but I think they're the big questions, uh, are, are serious ones. To do any of those things requires a, a much greater sense of compromise on both sides than has existed now for a number of years. Um, I think, and, and this is a bipartisan comment, I think the best that can be said about the leaders of both hard parties in the Senate and the House is that at best they are weak and highly partisan. I think one can actually be much more critical of both sets of leaders, but I think that's where we are. Um, I think President Obama for four years has by and large not engaged Washington politics. Uh, he, he has, I, I don't mean he has disdained it, but he has not been the eager participant that, say, someone like Lyndon Johnson was, uh, or Bill Clinton was, uh, getting out and rubbing elbows with members of Congress of both parties and trying to achieve deals. I think this is going to, the, where we are is going to require a different kind of leadership from the president. I think compromise, as I said, is necessary, and the president is the president and the only president, and the president has to lead that movement uh, toward compromise uh, positions. Um, let me, as opposed to saying what I'm sure will happen, let me say several things I'm sure are not going to happen, or there are no indications that they're going to happen. One is, I, I see no significant constituency in terms of serious campaign finance reform. We, we have just gone through an election in which each candidate spent roughly a billion dollars. That's obscene by any standard of good government. That's obscene. And it's where we are, and I don't think either party is interested in changing uh, that reality. Secondly, uh, we draw congressional districts according to one basic rule, and both parties agree to the rule and have agreed to the rule for years, and that is incumbents should win. Most of the congressional districts in the country are not competitive. They have not been competitive for years. Occasionally a few incumbents lose, but it's very unlikely. We, we have not found a way to create electoral districts that reflect r real districts where people have some congruity in terms of where they live and so on, and uh, I don't see any interest in doing that. Thirdly, uh, we have a coherent energy policy in this country. It is to keep gasoline and fuel oil as cheap as possible for as long as possible for as many as possible. And neither of our leaders, neither of our parties, none of our leaders, are willing to seriously engage in that conversation. During the debates, there was a question about $4 gasoline, whether that was likely to continue. Both candidates, Governor Romney and President Obama, ran as fast from that question as they could. The, the, the reality of energy policy in this country is political leaders are not able to talk honestly to the American people about where we are and where we need to go. Uh, comments, I, I've been an environmental lawyer for a long time, comments about alternative energy are, in my opinion, largely foolishness if we don't change the basic price of fossil fuels. Uh, the rest of it is, is, is going to be futile for a long time uh, if we don't do it. Fourthly, or fifthly, I've lost count here, um, uh, the Electoral College is not going to change. It's, it may well be an 18th century remnant, but President Obama is very aware today the Electoral College, as opposed to the popular vote, which is very close, the Electoral College provides much greater sense of a national mandate than does the electoral outcome. And so and I think presidential candidates have realized this actually for some time. Furthermore, every small state in the country understands in a close election how the Electoral College serves their needs uh, because they do count. And uh, the country was built on that compromise. The small states would get counted. And I think uh, there is no movement uh, or likely to be toward elimination of uh, the Electoral College. Um, my time is up. I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, well, maybe I'll start with, uh, with the things that Professor Booth has said and, uh, and, and where I agree and disagree, because I have some, uh, I, I do have one disagreement, but, uh, but the agreement is quite strong. Campaign finance reform is in the Democratic platform. And 
it's, I'm, I'm sure that Democrats would, would like to do it. Um, but the president himself, I think, is somewhat compromised on that since he's the one who destroyed the public finance system by not taking it in the general election and was the first presidential candidate to forego public funding uh, in the general. And after that, you know, everybody will probably rely on, on private funding, even though the public system is theoretically still there. Democrats would like to repeal Citizens United, and they don't have a snowball's chance of doing that. It's very difficult to amend the Constitution. So there we are with this enormous, enormous problem of money and elections reaching uh, its high point this year, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court and that decision. Um, as far as energy, I also agree that though the Democratic platform uh, talks about climate change and, and Obama last night or early this morning, I guess it was, uh, did mention climate change and the crowd roared, yes, yes, this is important. Finally, somebody really talks about it and that's a difference between him and Romney uh, and between Democrats and Republicans and yet he is committed to his all of the above strategy very much, uh, I, I think it would be inclined to approve the Keystone Pipeline, uh, though he never actually said that. Uh, and, and Romney did, of course, um, and would be quite enthusiastic about natural gas drilling, even by fracking. The two constraints here, though, I think are, I mean, particularly the one, is that social movements may push him. Presidents only do what they have to do. And when there are movements in their base, one thinks of Roosevelt, who was really a pretty conservative guy, uh, but he faced these big national movements toward doing something for the elderly that led to social security, doing something for the poor, which led to a great expansion uh, of jobs programs, uh, and doing something for labor, which he wasn't inclined to do, but the, but the labor movement pushed him. If Obama faces movements on the ground to do much more about climate change, uh, much more about alternative fuels, uh, to not approve the Keystone Pipeline, which might well be a great blessing for both us and Canada, and we may have a movement ultimately in Canada against what that, what, uh, that kind of, of oil extraction process has done uh, to the provinces where it happens in the rest of Canada. So, so movements, I think, are, the, are the, big, uh, the big unknown out there. If there are movements, Obama will move toward them uh, to the left. Um, and why do I say that with, with much confidence? Um, this gets to my disagreement with Professor Booth. It depends on what we mean by things go badly for presidents or presidents don't do well in their second term. My claim would be that presidents are better if they get two terms. If you take away that the need to be reelected, you get better people in the second term. Ronald Reagan was a much better president in his second term. He put aside his bellicosity. He negotiated with the Russians a, an end a, and a faster end to, to the Cold War. Um, and he was ready to give up all nuclear weapons in his second term. Right? They get cut loose, in a sense. And, and you get more of what you thought was in the guy uh, in the beginning, because they don't have that very conservative pressure. Um, so that I think the three things that determine what will happen in this second Obama administration. I, it can be tied in a political science-y kind of structural way uh, to the coalition that elected him, to the platform, uh, and to timing. Now, platforms might surprise you to know, unless you take a political science course, in which case you probably do know, that the platform is actually quite predictive. Presidents do what they say they'll do. They generally write those platforms, you know, with a lot of help from the party, not deviating much from the party center of gravity. Um, but if you look at the platform, I think you're going to see those things. They talk about uh, expanding education, about infrastructure, about including in the energy policy alternative fuels, uh, about jobs, about not privatizing Social Security and Medicare, about tax code fairness, which means making the rich pay their share, uh, and so on. And I think those are things one can count on uh, the Democrats do, at least Obama and, and the Senate trying to do. Uh, what was Obama's coalition? Uh, she has talked about that. Uh, and it's, it's not a surprise, except perhaps in, in greater enthusiasm among your age group 
than people thought we would have given uh, the, the rather dismal state of the economy still. But young people, minorities, women, the poor, and cities. So look for action there, and you are the action. Right? You are the young. In a sense, uh, I don't want to sound partisan, but if you've got to make a choice, I'd say go with the young. Right? It, you are the future. I think everything good that has happened on this campus uh, in, with regard to environment and sustainability and so on, it's come from you. It's come from movements of students, and that's going to be true on a global scale. Um, so think about that. This, I'm handing it over to you. And you're going to have to decide what to do about people like me. Uh, because we've got this tremendous, you know, the aging population is taking up such a big chunk, bigger every day, uh, of the budget. And uh, you're going to have to decide what to do about your grandparents and, and your parents. Because otherwise, it's going to bankrupt us. And there are a lot of really dumb things we do in health policy and spending such a big chunk of our health policy on people in the last year of life, often in a really dismal state in which they would not choose and didn't choose to be alive. That, they're, they're really huge moral problems to grapple with, and, and they're huge interests to grapple with. Uh, if you look at the stock market today, I thought Richard might mention it, but you know, who, who's planning, who thinks they're going to lose and who thinks he's going to win? You know the stocks that went down today? Wall Street crashed, in a way. Uh, the stocks that went down, coal. <laughs> Boy, have you seen a lot of their ads lately? Uh, coal, <laughs> oil gas, finance, <laughs> and military. Those are the stocks that went down. Up oh, went insurance companies. <laughs> uh, can we get that health care going? They have a lot more paid customers out there. Alternative energy. There are not a lot that went up. Can you think of any other stuff? I didn't that went up. There <laughs> not many. Uh, the downers, well, you know, an apple crashed and for reasons of its own, uh, an antitrust suit, et cetera. <laughs> but, uh, I, th I think we have a pretty good idea what the Democrats are going to try to do, but the intensity with which they try to do it is going to come from social movements. And you, your age cohort, you're the biggest part of it. I think women are going to push hard. This was an election in which women played a big role, and there's a very there's a what a 12 point gender gap. Uh, so it is in a, in a sense a women's election. If you look at some of the women elected to the Senate, uh, this Senate is going to be more liberal. The House may be a bit more conservative. The Tea Party's still going to be there. They didn't lose anything. Uh, they even added a few people. But the Senate is going to be more liberal. And can you imagine Elizabeth Warren really compromising away part of the finance reform one last time? Um, so that's going to be fun to watch. And those are the people with the movement that's in this coalition who are going to help pull Obama to the left. But let me, I know I'm running into, am I running? I'm running. Okay. So You're because, over, kid. I'm sorry. Let me just say this in, in one minute. You were more likely to have another war, and it would probably have been Iran if Romney had won, uh, because presidents don't make war nearly as much. I have data on that in their second term. So we may have dodged a bullet. The world may have dodged a bullet. That's a good seg for you. Well, it's a good seg. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to actually focus on foreign policy in my few minutes. I'm tempted, however, and maybe we can talk about this in discussion. I do have some questions from my fellow panelists that are not foreign policy related, but I'll focus here on foreign policy and what we can expect to see in a second uh, Obama term. Um, and the first, I want to make maybe three points. The first one is a bit of a cop-out point, which is that it's hard to predict what's going to happen in foreign policy in the second term. And the reason for that is that presidents, I think, I think foreign policy is probably the least predictable um, arena uh, for a president. Elizabeth just finished saying that presidents tend to a act on their platforms. I think that's quite correct. In domestic policy, they have an opportunity to do that. I think it's much harder um, to do in foreign policy, simply because foreign policy produces surprises. And, for, and presidents invariably find, historically, that they have to be reactive in dealing in international affairs. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt could come in and for the first, say, term and a half of his administration, he could be more or less an isolationist. Um, but the rise of Nazi Germany 
uh, and the threat from Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan forced FDR to shift. Uh, many other examples we could think of. Elizabeth mentioned one, which is uh, Ronald Reagan in his second term, um, embracing a very different approach to the Cold War, ultimately leading to the end of the Cold War, because of Mikhail Gorbachev's uh, ascension to power in the Soviet Union. Um, and so it's difficult, therefore, for me, or for us, to sit here today and talk about what's going to happen in foreign policy um, uh, under this new Obama administration. Um, and I think the second point I guess I would make is one that connects to the first point, and that is that continuity I anticipate in foreign policy will be the watchword. This tends to be the case in foreign policy. Uh, interestingly enough, it tends to be the case even when we have a change in president, even when we have a change in party. I think, again, if you look historically, uh, presidents um, coming in from a new party, let's say Mitt Romney had won. He certainly said early in the campaign, not so much in that third debate, but early in the campaign he said that he would do things very differently in foreign policy. We have a failed foreign policy under this president, watch what I will do when I come in. Um, once, however, they take power, I think they find that there are lots of reasons to, to pursue continuity in foreign policy. They have so much to learn, so many positions to fill, far better to just maintain the status quo, uh, and then later on, once we've figured things out, then there can be an opportunity to, to take stock and perhaps change course. And quite often it doesn't. Um, and I think, I think in this case, we're likely to see continuity also because I believe that Barack Obama thinks he did a pretty good job in his first term in foreign policy. Um, and the American public seems to agree, Mitt Romney, did not wish, as we all know from the third debate, boy, what a strange experience that was, <laughs> to see Romney on question after question basically say, I agree with the president, and I support what the president has done in this area, and I too will make sure we, we, we withdraw from Afghanistan by the end of 2014, time after time. This was obviously a strategy on, on Romney's part and his advisor's part, but the point is he was not willing to engage that he believed and his advisors believed that in fact, unlike most Democrats historically, at least in recent history, Obama was not really um, assailable, uh, was not really um, vulnerable on foreign policy, and he didn't want to go there. So that's another reason I think we can expect to see some continuity. The third point is the contradictory one, or is to suggest that in fact, what I've suggested uh, uh, may not uh, happen. That is to say, and this is something that Elizabeth, I think, hinted at and I want to pursue, it is possible to imagine that in a second term, Barack Obama, in fact, will be bolder on several foreign policy issues than he was willing to be in his first term. And ironically enough, bolder than a first term Romney would be. The irony of that is to say that foreign policy might change more under a continuation of a sitting president than it would have if we'd had a new president taking office in January from a different party. Um, in his second and therefore final term, Barack Obama does not have to think about re-election. He does not have to uh, have the same kind of political calcula calculations that he's had in his first term. Um, he'll never run for office again. Um, and so I can imagine on certain policy issues that in fact he will pursue uh, new policies. Cuba, for example. Not impossible to imagine that he might say that the embargo that we've had in place now for the last, what is it, 50, 60 years, um, is really a stupid policy that does not serve the Cuban people, does not serve our interests, um, and that we should end it. Um, that's a possibility. Climate change, both, both Professor Booth and Professor Sanders have mentioned climate change. It's conceivable that in the foreign policy sense of, of addressing climate change, he will now be more willing to push in, in that area than he would have been before. He talked early in his term, as you will recall, about the abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, this is obviously an, an enormous undertaking, but I can imagine that he will go a further distance than he was subsequently willing to do in his first term to try to have a serious discussion about 
that issue. Withdrawing American troops from Europe, something that I think, again, presidents, at least for the last 10 years or so, have been thinking is the right thing to do. Um, he might be willing to entertain. More seriously, a diplomatic deal with Iran, which is something we can talk about in Q&A if anybody's interested. Um, on a range of issues, it's possible that he would be willing to do these things. Now, caveat here, of course, is that um, he does not have full freedom of action because he's got a future Democratic nominee uh, whispering in his ear. Hillary Clinton might say to him, please, Barack, don't change Cuba policy. I need Cuba's electoral votes, and it's 29 electoral votes, I think, right? Yes, and Florida, not Cuba. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Florida's, I need Florida's electoral votes. Um, and I need Florida's electoral votes, and I would, please, I would, I would beg you not to change this. I will change it after I get elected. Um, and she could say the same, or Joe Biden, if he's the nominee or prospective nominee. Many of these Democrats are probably thinking that they would rather not take the chance. That's, after all, a key consideration on, it, on issues like this. Maybe the Cuba policy is, 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 is a mistake and counterproductive, but why take the chance when potentially a very important state like Florida could hinge on this? But that's... that's um, that's the third point I would make. I'd conclude by suggesting um, that Barack Obama will have very important decisions to make on Afghanistan, something I haven't mentioned. Uh, neither candidate, as you know, in the campaign was really willing to, to engage on Afghanistan, but I think there are very difficult uh, decisions coming. I think it's easy to imagine a scenario uh, like the following, that in, in, say, two years, the Taliban will control large portions of southern Afghanistan and will control areas where Americans were killed following President Obama's escalation in 2009. How will he respond in the coming year or two if that situation deteriorates? And I think it's likely to deteriorate. And how do you, do you engage, do you negotiate with the Taliban and if so under what conditions? So the Afghanistan issue, I think, is one that looms large. And of course, there are several other policy issues that we could discuss. I think what I will do there, however, is turn things over to Glenn. Thank you. Uh, in politics, as in most areas of life, uh, it's a lot better to be lucky than smart. Uh, my career of 42 years proves this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so does the political career of Barack Obama. Uh, when he ran for the United States Senate, uh, the two candidates uh, slated to oppose him withdrew because of sex scandals, uh, and he ran against Alan Keyes, who lived in Maryland uh, and not Illinois. Uh, when he, in his two campaigns for president, uh, he ran against two of the weakest opponents uh, put up by the Republican Party in many, many years. In his presidency, however, at least in his first term, President Obama was not so lucky. Uh, he faced uh, an economic crisis which was much deeper than he or his advisors uh, had thought it was, and he made some promises uh, uh, about uh, the impact of his policies uh, that proved to be misguided, wrong, and politically dangerous. I believe uh, that his second term may be quite different. And I'm gonna do something uh, this afternoon which professors usually don't do. Most professors see their role uh, as leaving their students as depressed as they are. <laughs> uh, hence uh, the uh, performance of my predecessors. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, lay out a scenario um, which at least provides the possibility uh, of thinking about the Obama administration, the second term, as being politically extremely successful. 
He's going to begin, as Dick Booth said, even before he takes the oath of office for a second term, facing the sequestration uh, if there is no agreement on the debt ceiling and on budget cuts. And one of two things is going to happen. Either there will be political pressure generated from the election for a compromise in the lame duck session, or if not, the stock market is going to go down 1,000 to 2,000 points, and that will create uh, the political pressure uh, for a deal at the beginning of his second term. If that happens, and he begins to gain political capital, he's going to introduce comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, Latinos uh, now comprise 9% uh, of the American electorate. It's the fastest growing uh, group uh, in the United States. Uh, it made it possible uh, for him to be reelected. Indeed, 45% of the people who voted for President Obama were not white. Uh, immigration reform, uh, which the Republicans will oppose at their political peril, will secure uh, uh, Latinos for uh, the Democratic Party for uh, many years to come. It then may well turn out to be the case that, pre uh, that uh, Governor Romney's promise to create 12,000 jobs, 12 million jobs in his administration is going to be relatively easy for President Obama to deliver on. Uh, do the math. Uh, creating 12 million jobs uh, involves about 250,000 jobs a month. Uh, that is fairly normal uh, uh, in a economy that is beginning to recover. Uh, and just as President Obama uh, suffered uh, from the economy that he inherited from President Bush, he may benefit from the economy that he inherits from himself. Uh, it is also important for you to know that the demography of the United States is changing dramatically, and almost all of those changes uh, benefit the Democratic Party. Uh, America is becoming less white. If you're at Cornell, if you were at Cornell 10 and 20 and 30 years ago, this panel would look, uh, I hope, the way it looks, uh, aging, uh, anemic looking uh, <laughs> uh, people, and you wouldn't look uh, uh, like you look youthful anemic people. Uh, uh, we will be many colors, uh, and America will be many colors. Uh, in the 21st century, the white population increased 5.7%. The black population increased about 15%. The Latino population increased about 43%. Given the position, uh, uh, positions of the Republican Party, that is bad news uh, uh, for them uh, in the future. And an adroit, adept, smart politician can use the presidency to leverage uh, that changing demography. Now, as uh, my colleagues all have said, uh, there are uh, looming uh, uh, issues uh, and challenges that the United States faces. Uh, that's always uh, been the case. And uh, presidents sometimes take on some of them, uh, and sometimes they don't. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily dictate uh, the success or failure uh, of their presidencies. So uh, let's do what we rarely do. Let's take a moment in the wake of the election, make it 72 hours, 
where we're optimistic about our future and the future of the country. Thanks. Well, uh, let me follow up and, and, and uh, a question for Glenn, I guess, or actually for, for, for all of you, but it's, it's, it's brought up by Glenn's comments. And first, let me say, Glenn, that I am actually quite optimistic about the second term. So whatever I suggested in my remarks, uh, I think that, in fact, uh, for Obama in, in, in political terms, and perhaps for all of us, for the reasons Glenn has spelled out, um, this is, this is uh, not just 72 hours, but hopefully a much longer time when we can feel good about things. But my question is this. It's about demography. And, and the, 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 the title of our panel, of course, is about, this is about looking ahead and what will they do now. And my question in a way touches on that, although it'll sound like I'm really focusing on the election. But I would like to know from my learned colleagues how the Republicans got themselves into this demographic problem. I think I have an answer, but the numbers from last night are striking. I wrote them down. 93% of uh, African American voters, 71% of Latino voters, 73% of Asian American voters, 60% of voters aged 19 to 29, who by the way turned out in larger numbers last night, uh, at least in terms of Obama's vote, than they did four years ago. But th those are the numbers, th those are the percentages of voters for the president. And for the reasons Glenn has laid out, it would seem to me that Republicans who are not stupid, Republicans would understand long before they finish this process and before the election is over, that they would find themselves in a very tough position. That unless you have, what, 45% of the electorate uh, um, uh, being uh, white, and unless you depress the turnout among the voters that I've just mentioned, the groups I've mentioned, they're toast. So how did they get themselves into this position? I, my simple answer would be, a rather reductionist answer, would be the primary system, which allows a very small minority uh, of a party uh, and you know about 20% of the entire electorate to change the course of the country. Uh, when the Tea Party surged ahead in 2010 uh, it, and sort of took over the Republican Party, it did make it less willing to compromise, uh, more extreme. I just heard Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, uh, a very conservative institution, uh, call the Republican Party an extreme radical insurgency. And the way you get there is by having the primary system. And I always apologize for having supported that in my foolish youth, uh, the system of primaries to choose delegates. Should have, gone, should, have, should have stuck with the old system. You know what I think is part of the other answer, though? Uh, and, and this you could read both ways or against the, uh, either party. The Republicans really are more bound and more motivated by ideas. The Democrats are more motivated and characterized uh, as coalition chunks, kind of stuck together, each of whom wants a particular thing. The Republicans are really good at having one idea that, and, and a litmus test, and everybody has to stick with that idea. Democrats could have gone with more of an idea. They could have defended Keynes, the most brilliant economist, I believe, that we ever had, and long considered the guiding spirit of the Democratic Party, but you never heard anybody talk about him. But you heard about Ayn Rand. Uh, you hear about Adam Smith. Uh, you hear about Hayek. Uh, so their ideas, I think, have driven them in, into a right-wing corner, and the Democrats haven't offered more powerful and engaging ideas, even though they're lying around. Uh, let me uh, elaborate on Elizabeth's uh, uh, comments. Uh, in, in my view, uh, the primary system, but also the shift of population and power uh, among Republicans from the Northeast to the Southwest uh, has changed the ideological composition of the Republican Party and made it more homogeneous, just as the evisceration of the Democratic Party in the South 
has made the Democratic Party more ideologically homogeneous. Americans are not as politically divided. They're not as polarized uh, as the country. Americans, in my view, are tend to be philosophically conservative and programmatically liberal. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Republicans fell in love with the power of their ideology. I would add to that that there's something of a cultural lag in this country, uh, and it fits with the demographic changes. Uh, and what I'm going to say is, again, a little bit of a prediction. I'm used to talking to Cornell alumni who are older than you, and so I tend to rely on the short-term memory loss of my audiences uh, uh, when I make predictions. Uh, so don't listen too carefully uh, uh, to what I'm about to say. Uh, I, I think the power of white evangelicals peaked in the United States in the 1990s and has been receding ever since. But the Republican Party still is in thrall uh, of, uh, of white evangelicals. The challenge for the Republican Party in the years to come is whether it is the party, it becomes the party of Paul Ryan, an evangelical Catholic, or the party of Jeb Bush, uh, who has a, uh, a la la Latino wife and is the kind of moderate, uh, at least in many uh, uh, areas, who used to constitute a significant component uh, uh, of the Republican Party. My bet in the very short run is that the defeat will be blamed on Governor Romney's moderate policies, uh, a mistake, it seems to me, and the Republican Party will move right for an Augenblick, uh, and uh, it will be followed uh, by the Republicans, especially as they begin to face the prospect of defeat after defeat, uh, doing a major reconsideration. One thing that it seems to me that could could um, could cause Republicans to not do what you're suggesting they might do is that uh, it just occurred to me now that in the midterm elections, the groups that have constituted the core of Obama's <coughs> coalition, the groups that I mentioned earlier, um, are less likely to turn out. And so a challenge for Democrats in 2014 will be to get uh, the, to, to get young voters, to get uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans to the polls, because Republicans, if they don't change, could see gains, it seems to me, because they do tend to turn out better in the midterm elections, and then they might not think the kinds of changes you're talking about will be necessary. Just, just one more comment. Look at the two high-profile losses by Republicans in the Senate. Todd Akin uh, and, uh, in Missouri and Murdoch in Indiana, uh, these are two. These were two seats which were a gimme for the Republicans to pick up. They lost them because they went to the far right candidates. The far right candidates uh, made some comments about rape uh, that weren't unfortunate. They were moronic, uh, uh, and, and those comments sunk those two candidates and made a significant difference in uh, the party. I do want to ask Elizabeth uh, this. Where does the idea come from that Congress will be more liberal uh, uh, in the years to come? It's going to be virtually identical to what it is now. But not the Senate. I think because you have some real reformers and because, because they knocked off a couple of, uh, of extremists there and you got Democrats even better than the moderate Republicans, even better from, in terms of making the Senate more. Before we go too far here, folks, the election yesterday was close. All right? It was two and a half million votes in the Electoral College, and, and, and members of the swing states are very close. What happened in 2010, what happened in 2008, is the Democrats overread the result. And, and the president overread the results, and the Republicans came surging back. So the, the Republicans then overread the results in 2010. And we have a, now we have a different result. 
The American people are not ideologues. They're practical people. They, they want solutions to kind of everyday problems. And I think they can swing in multiple ways. The debate is, I, I'm a Democrat. I, it would be presumptuous for me to think I can speak for what the Republicans are going to do. But I think the debate inside the Republican Party has already, already started about what to do regarding, for example, Hispanics and, and blacks and so on. And I think that debate will go on, um, and, and we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think what happens in elections is they get the results get overread. The Democrats are likely now to do exactly what the Republicans did in 2010, think the American people have sent a large mandate to move in one direction. They haven't. The American public is very deeply divided on a number of basic questions. They were very deeply divided four years ago. They remain very deeply divided. And to get anything done in Washington today, you have to bring, somehow bring together Democrats and Republicans. You can have all, all the ideological ideas you, if you want in each party, but nothing will get done. What, what President Obama ought to take is a lesson from Governor Cuomo. If, if you think Washington politics are bad, come to Albany with me for a week. Albany makes Washington politics look wise, long-sighted, and careful. <laughs> right? What Andrew Cuomo has done is reach an agreement with the Republican leadership, and that's how he's accomplished things. All right? And, and, and that's the way we, we make some progress on some pretty big issues. If you think the nation is divided, uh, the Republican politics and Democratic politics in New York State has been a zero-sum game for decades. All right? For decades. And Cuomo has figured out how to make some progress. And I think that's what we're going to have to do. Both sides if the country's going to accomplish anything, are going to have to give up uh, a good deal in order to find some solutions in the middle that enough people will support so the country can make some progress. Otherwise, we'll have four more years as we had now, which is largely deadlocked. And, and a lot of big questions largely don't get addressed. I'm not sure who it is on this panel you're disagreeing with. Uh, but you seem so vociferous that uh, uh, I can, I'll just agree with you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, obviously, compromise is needed in Washington. Uh, uh, of course, as you know, it takes two to tango. Uh, and when uh, Mitch McConnell, the minority leader in the Senate, said that his primary aim was to make Barack Obama a one-term president, and the Republican Party was the party of no, uh, that compromise was more difficult. Uh, Mitch, Mitch McConnell's defensiveness, I'll use that word as a polite word, doesn't come close to matching the op opposition of Democratic senators to civil rights legislation. And Lyndon Johnson found a way to start moving around that. That's what great presidents do. L they Lyndon, find a way L to find a middle ground. Lyndon Johnson, look, Lyndon Johnson, Dick, let me just remind you, the Senate was 68 Democrats to 32 Republicans, and, and, Ever and, Ever and, and, e and Everett Dirksen of uh, Illinois Reform. brought a dozen or more Republicans to vote for the Civil Rights Bill. So the example really doesn't apply. Uh, uh, and, and the numbers were there in the Senate to defeat a filibuster. The numbers are not there uh, in the Senate to defeat a filibuster or were not there in this year. So it's easy to call for compromise. We all do it. The question is what will be the content of the compromise and what will be the approach taken that achieves that compromise? That's the tougher question. Well, I agree. But We've had four years of gridlock, and we've got to find ways to get around that. Uh, or big questions just go undealt with. And you do have it's to ultimately, ultimately, it's the president who has the most responsibility for, for trying to find ways to make that happen. This is a wonderful, this is a wonderful exchange of views, and I, but I'd like to bring the audience into that now. Uh, and, uh, we don't want to hear from the people in the audience, Bob. <laughs> We're having a good time here. <laughs> Uh, and could you butt out, please? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sure we can continue this after 6 o'clock. But, uh, but before that, uh, let, let me uh, uh, permit the audience to get engaged with questions or comments. And we have microphones in the back. Is that right? 
And so we're going to be able to, yes, uh, bring them down and uh, maybe we can start with this. Hello? Yeah. yeah. I'm an international student. Uh, so I want to ask your expert opinion on uh, what president will do for international student policy. Uh, in, the, in the past years, I, I kind of think, ironically, I see uh, Americans losing their control on illegal uh, immigrants and more willing to take illegal immigrants. But for people like me who come here legally, paying for tuition and willing to be work harder than an average American and willing to pay for taxes. Uh, things just getting harder for us to get sponsorship. Uh, I see companies who are willing to sponsor international students in the past stop doing so. So I really care and want to you hear your prediction on how things will progress. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, and I think it's a real problem. And in my capacity as director of the Ainaudi Center here on campus, I have at least some uh, familiarity, shall we say, with the problem you identify. And I think it is real on this campus, on other university campuses across the country, and as you also say in the, in the business world. Um, I think that uh, at least many members of Congress are partly through the efforts of uh, people on various campuses, including those of us in Ainaudi, members of Congress in the Senate and the House are aware of this problem, that it's just becoming much more difficult uh, in many cases to get the visas, to get um, permission to be here and to, to contribute to the American economy, to the American kind of intellectual life. Um, I, I, my sense is that Barack Obama also understands this problem. But it's not a very good answer to your question because I don't have the sense currently at least that we're moving forward in addressing this problem. There are some signs that it's a little easier than it's been, say, three, four years ago. I think it needs to continue because it's, um, it's in so many ways what has, in terms of American higher education, it, it is what has brought our system to be in many cases, the, in many respects, the envy of the world is the, the ability of people like you to come to contribute to what's going on here at Cornell and also, of course, to American society. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, I have three loud boys. Okay. In the Republican primary, when there was ten, when, when there were ten candidates, uh, including such luminaries as Herman Cain, uh, 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 one of the questioners uh, asked the candidates, "Would you agree to a budget deal which had nine dollars of spending cuts for every dollar of tax increases?" and every Republican on the panel said no. Uh, that is going to be the pivot around the discussion. President Obama, in my view, uh, did not respond if, as effectively as he did uh, to the implacable opposition uh, of the Republicans. There's a conciliatory strain uh, that uh, he has that needs to be tempered with some steel, uh, uh, in my view. And in a second term, he may have learned that. I, I would respond by saying, hopefully, if there's room. I don't know. Glenn, Glenn's points are very well taken. Uh, one of the things I left off my list earlier of what doesn't change and hasn't changed and won't change is that Washington is dominated by one and two year cycles. Everything else, whatever the issues are, is dominated by one year budget decisions and by two year electoral cycles for the House of Representatives. Every person elected yesterday has to start running again in six months, all right? And 
that's part of the reality we're dealing with. But I, I would take, at least for now, the sign as a hopeful one. And, and again, it, it's going to be on the shoulders of the president to help push this forward. And if we don't make progress, I think we haven't used the word legacy. That was used actually a fair amount last night. I think President Obama is thinking about his legacy. If nothing moves, a legacy is going to be a shorter list than he would hope. I just wanted to add that there is, there are comments in the platform that might reverberate with, with Boehner, uh, though I'm, I'm a bit skeptical, that uh, they're willing to, for example, uh, Obama and the Democrats who signed off on this platform are willing to uh, lower corporate income taxes uh, as long as they get cooperation on closing loopholes. But, you know, <laughs> loopholes, uh, that I, I would think that it's going to be much harder for the Republicans to allow taxes on people with incomes, 250000 a year and, and higher, to pay higher taxes. But, but there are ways to get at their income uh, in somewhat smaller chunks, uh, like uh, capital gains taxes, dividend taxes, uh, the special treatment of hedge fund incomes, and things like that. It just depends on how much you could raise with Good. This gentleman right here in the back. Uh, Bill, Bill, they all agree to talk about uh, two year cycles in Washington. How do you think that longer electoral cycles might uh, affect how politics work in Washington? Um, what do you mean by a longer? So, like, say that I'm not, not talking about the actual likelihood of there being a longer presidency, but how do you think that that would influence? Um, I've thought for policy? a long time we went to four year House terms exactly. consistent with the presidential elections. American politics. Would, would be more successful on a number of levels. But I don't, that's not a short-term likelihood. But I, I think four years of House of Representatives would make a lot of sense. Eight years of senators so that you'd elect half the Senate each time. But I think that the dominance of these cycles is a very, very substantial issue. I agree with that. And when you put, the, put it together with a midterm election that comes only two years after you come in, if, if you're in the middle of the most severe recession since the Depression, you just can't get out of it in two years. But you can do enough in two years to antagonize and, and mobilize uh, the opposition. It's just not long enough. I know one headline in the New York Times today says uh, something like, you know, a closely divided electorate gives Obama a little longer to prove he can do something. That's what presidents need a little longer to prove they can do something. I mean, uh, going along with that question, uh, it's often, you know, one can speculate about if you had a single six-year term for a president, what would be the result? And some suggest that you would actually have um, a willingness on the part of presidents to make tough decisions because they, they can't run for re-election. That concern is gone. And I think in a, in a classic foreign policy case, the escalation of the war in, in Vietnam, it's clear to me that Lyndon Johnson framed his decisions on Vietnam and decided to Americanize a war that he actually didn't, I think, privately believe in because of his concerns about the electoral implications should he, uh, as he might put it, turn tail and run. Now, others might say that, in fact, the need to, to think about re-election will have a salutary effect on policymaking. So you could probably argue it both ways, but that's another one that, that um, is interesting to think about. But it's interesting if you go back in history and realize how many governorships for a long time were two years. And, and I don't know what the numbers are now, but many of them now are four years. I think that's part of the reality. Many mayor's terms for years and years and years were two-year terms, and many of the big city mayors now are four years. Because it's just, it's just too short a time to get office. You find out where the wastebaskets are in the restrooms, and then you're running for re-election. Uh, and that's a problem. This gentleman here, please. Uh, thank you for your discussion. Um, so you guys talked about some economic gridlock, which was a problem. Um, but I wonder if you could speak on the contiguity of some policies that we saw from the Bush years through Obama. So in relation to monetary policy, maybe, or to international trade policy, things that we can see um, that are relatively similar and how much those things have affected the current situation that we're in today. So they might not agree on you know, what the top marginal tax rate should be, but they generally agree on what inflation should be. They generally agree on um, what their trade relations are going to be with China, things of that nature, if you could comment. I think that presidents um, of, of either party tend to be, over time, in, in comparison with Congress members from their own party, for example, presidents tend to be more free trade, more pro-immigration, 
and more warlike, and for people who bemoan the continuity between George W. Bush and Barack Obama, it's that he has, for example, taken the dr use of drones, which uh, was pioneered by George Bush, and turned it into a behemoth, uh, and, and killed so many more people, and had so many more drone strikes, that, uh, you know, if, if we could really fine tune our analysis of turnout, I wonder how many liberals were really turned off on that. You look at something that's gonna be an issue for the next few years, and I think it's drone use. Uh, you're killing American citizens, right? Even, even American citizens. You're killing a lot of, killing a thousand women and children as well. Classifying every male with a gun as a, as a terrorist, or at least a militant. Uh, and in that sense, there's great continuity. In the pushing of executive power, doing things by executive order, tremendous continuity. Moving over here, yes. So you, you, I think you said that uh, Obama will be pushing comprehensive immigration reform, very substantial. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, so how will, how specifically will the Republican Party move to, uh, you know, accommodate this if indeed the Hispanic uh, vote will be much more important in the coming years? And you know, will will he be pushing something, you know, in your opinion, uh, that will that will be similar to the Green Map? That's it, that seems like. That seems like a good compromise, at least if, if the opposition proves uh, to remain very strong and the Republicans don't re-examine that policy. We have to remember that traditionally, historically, the Republicans have been the policy of large-scale immigration and few limits on immigration. It's good business to, and, you know, to have that renewal of the workforce and, and to, have, to have a large workforce. And, and it also kind of undermined uh, unionization. But that's the historical position of the Republican Party. Um, so maybe maybe they'll sort of remember that. But I think the Dream Act in in giving a path to citizenship for people who were brought to this country as children through through no action on their own part, it, and then maybe finding some special status to their parents, whereby the, for family reunification um, you can you could give them sort of a permanent work status without citizenship might suggest the lines of a compromise. You know, you could you could make an argument that that. One of the biggest mistakes that Mitt Romney made, let me, let me suggest maybe it was the biggest mistake he made, was in the primaries when because of the presence of Rick Perry in that, in that primary race and the belief early on that Perry was the man to beat, that Romney decided that he had to stake out a position on immigration that was to the right, if you can imagine, of Rick Perry. Uh, and I think this goes back to a point Elizabeth made earlier, that, that the, the nature of of that nominating process uh, and of what Romney felt he had to do in order to secure the nomination, then uh, put him in a box on immigration when it came time for the general campaign. An interesting counterfactual is, was Romney in fact correct in his belief that to win the nomination he had to move as far right as he did? I'm not sure. I, I'm, I like to think that maybe if Mitt Romney had said yes, I was a governor of, a, of, a, of Massachusetts, I had a moderate conservative position as governor and carried out policies that were moderate in many respects, and that's what we need. After all, the American electorate tends to be in the center when, when push comes to shove. Maybe he still would have gotten the nomination and been in a better position for the, for the general campaign. I think the pressure on immigration reform, reform actually may come from governors. They're facing many of the costs of illegal immigration their states have to pay for them, education, medicine, you know, the huge costs in Medicaid, uh, not Medicaid, but in, in terms of emergency care and so on. And I think governors may, both Republicans and Democrats, may be the people that become the strongest voices for a comprehensive reform. Other, this gentleman here? Uh, given that in the past, Given that in this year's election that President Obama won by a much narrower margin than he did in 2008, and given the outcome of the congressional elections, do you think it's going to be more difficult in the next four years for more what? Uh, more difficult. More difficult in the next four years for President Obama to exert his executive power and accomplish things than it was in the past four years? Did, 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 did you ever hear the expression "a win is a win"? Uh, a George W. Bush lost 
the presidential election <laughs> of 2000 and took that loss as his mandate to govern. Uh, uh, and he then governed, whether you like it or not, very aggressively. The notion of a mandate, whatever relevance it had for the ancient Greeks, uh, uh, is not terribly relevant to 21st century American politics. And the size of the majority makes no difference at all uh, to the capacity and even the political power of the president to govern. The composition of Congress uh, uh, may make a difference. Other qualities that the president has may make a difference, but not the size of, it, of the vote. John Kennedy won by an extraordinarily narrow margin. His uh, response one day was the, the margin is narrow, the mandate is clear. I think what's surprising is that President Obama didn't more aggressively use the mandate he had four years ago uh, in terms of leadership. This lady here. You know, it didn't seem to help much. There, there's, there's a good bit of opposition out there to it. Uh, the, uh, you know, the party of non-voters, as political scientists sometimes describe them, uh, people who weren't registered but were nevertheless interviewed, uh, who didn't really indicate uh, th that they were going to vote. If you look at their positions on health care, they were really for it. It's their only hope. Um, but, but for the voters, judging by the exit polls, uh, there, there's a good bit of opposition. I have, you know, there weren't but, national exit polls this time the way we've had them in the past. They're just state by state, so it's kind of hard to put put those together. And I haven't seen a good source of them, and I, I really haven't seen the breakdown. Maybe somebody else in the panel has. Uh, so it it may be that you may have a modal number of people who say they want to fix it, but not do away with it completely. And you know, how do you fix it? My, my guess is it's gonna get more popular as it goes along. Well, I, I think one of the clear results of yesterday is that Obamacare is in place and it's not gonna disappear because it requires a, a two thirds of the Senate and the House to override a presidential veto. And that certainly isn't, I don't think, in the cards either way. Um, I think as we go forward, there are gonna be numerous requests, demands, whatever pressures to fix pieces of it, all right? And I think, for example, to get it passed, there's a lot of unevenness in terms of how different states are treated. And I think the governors in the states that are feel unfairly treated are, are gonna be demanding uh, that some of those problems be fixed. Uh, we, here we have a national health care bill, but we still leave to state governments to decide which companies can sell insurance. There's a huge difference in, a, in what numbers of companies can actually sell insurance from state to state, meaning Insurance is much more competitive as a market item in some states than it is in other states. I think that probably eventually will change. And thirdly, I think one of the big fears is a lot of the medical community is going to start walking away. And, and I think that's obviously got to be fixed. And I think one of the ways to do that is to pass national legislation that imposes significant li uh, limits on liability for doctors and, and other medical professionals. That, that was something the tort lawyers of the country adamantly opposed, but it's in the country's interest and we ought to move in that direction. You know, the way you, the way you phrase the question is quite interesting, and I hadn't really thought of it in, this terms, in these terms before, but what, what effect did it have on the, on the outcome is basically your question. My sense is that maybe it didn't have that much of an effect, that I think a lot of people who voted for the president and who voted against the president listed Obamacare as one of the reasons why they were voting the way they did, but I'm not sure that it as an issue really uh, affected the, the the vote that much that in the absence of Obamacare, maybe we'd have a, a broadly speaking similar outcome. You know, one one way it does come in though is that if you look at the composition of the Tea Party, the strongest supporters, so those who would say I am a member of the Tea Party, it's something close to seventy percent of them are getting Medicare or veterans pensions. Uh, so they've got their socialized medicine, 
and don't want anybody else to have it. I, I don't want to be unkind with that, but it's, I think it's hard to see it any other way. It get, they have a kind of security, and they can then say, you know, this is terrible, this is socialism. You know, get, get, the, get the government's hands off my Medicare. Um, and that's, th that gave the Tea Party a, a lot of its impetus. To I, I, I would just add that um, uh, as uh, Rick Santorum predicted in the primaries, it was particularly difficult for Romney to make uh, the Affordable Health Care Act a pivotal issue uh, in the campaign since uh, the legislation had its origins uh, in Massachusetts. And that somewhat neutralized the issue. Having said that, I would add just one comment. It, uh, senior citizens trended toward Governor Romney uh, in the election. They weren't scared off, as some people thought, by the choice of Paul Ryan, uh, who supports voucherizing uh, uh, Medicare. And they may have been persuaded by the argument that Obamacare, it's a specious argument, but it was an argument that was made, took um, billions of dollars from Medicare uh, uh, in order to fund it. Uh, and, and so um, uh, uh, this issue, it seems to me, didn't uh, play to the advantage of President Obama, but probably didn't have that much impact in the other direction. And I'm afraid we've now reached 6 o'clock, so that uh, what a wonderful and fascinating uh, panel discussion. I thank you very much. Thank you.